Please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 5. Uh, We'll be reading verses 19 through 30. Then next week we go into Advent season. That came quickly. Uh, So we'll begin a short Advent series for the next four weeks. Uh, But today we're going to be in John 5. Uh, Last time we left off in John 5, or last time we left off in John, we were, uh, we had discussed Jesus healing at the pool of uh, Bethesda, excuse me. Today's passage is Jesus' response to the religious leaders after healing at this pool on the Sabbath. He's being accused, of course, of violating the Sabbath. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 19. You have a sermon outline for notes on page 4 in your bulletin if you uh, like to use that. This is God's holy word. I'm going to go back to verse 18. This is God's holy word. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father." Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, may you speak to us through the reading and preaching of your word, and may the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. It was over 20 years ago, I sat in the disciplinarian's office in my high school, facing a suspension, being reprimanded for fighting, when the secretary informed Mr. Donahue, my disciplinarian, that a witness to the fight, to the incident, wanted to speak with him. He stood up. After berating me, he left the room, and he returned 10 minutes later and began to profusely thank me. (laughs) I was a little confused. Uh, Talked about being saved at the last moment. And uh, what happened was there was a new student and his mother, who had just moved into our school district after the death of their father from cancer, and upon moving at their, arriving at our school, uh, being a new student in high school, he became the target of bullying. Now, all of this, I was unaware. That morning, I saw a boy who was being cornered by two upperclassmen. Uh, they were taunting him. Uh, It was starting, I could tell it was moving in the direction of becoming physical, and then I tried to break it up. As they began to attack this young boy, I was trying to diffuse the situation verbally. I was unsuccessful, so I finally, I physically intervened to stop the bullies from injuring or harming him. 
What I remember even more than the fight, actually I have very little memory of the fight, what I remember the most was my disciplinarian's unexpected response. He transitioned from scolding me to thanking me for fighting. He was thanking me for fighting. The school had a zero tolerance fighting policy that was established to protect students from violence. And what my disciplinarian explained was that my actions did not violate the spirit of this policy, but appropriately expressed it because these two upperclassmen would have gravely injured this small young teen. The religious leaders sought to kill Jesus because he healed, healed on the Sabbath. He healed on the Lord's day. The Lord, the one who heals people from their sins. You see, just as my actions aligned with the school's policy, or at least the spirit of it, Jesus' actions aligned with the Lord's purpose for the Sabbath. In today's passage, and there is a lot here. We could do like two sermons or three sermons on this passage. But today's passage is essentially Jesus' response to the objections by these religious leaders. And through Jesus' words, we learn that he reveals God. Jesus reveals God. And that he gives life to those in need of life, because Jesus is life. And lastly, Jesus brings justice to a world filled with sin, evil, and injustices. So first, Jesus reveals God. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son, shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him so that you may marvel. The church my family was a part of before moving to Mississippi, uh, Wheatland Presbyterian Church, we celebrated the Lord's Supper weekly. You would walk to the front of the sanctuary where an elder would, would pray over you or your, your family together. They would give you the bread and the wine, and then your family would, would return to your pew where you would wait for everyone to be served, and then we would all partake together. After a time of this practice, Kelsey noticed that Elijah, my son, he would sit next to me and that he would pretend to hold the bread and the wine together and then that he would partake, pretend partake alongside of me. He watched me. He was ensuring that he would mimic my actions precisely, simultaneously. And it reminded me of an important truth. That fathers, they, they play crucial roles in their children's development. Uh, social sciences and psychology continue to uncover new insights into the role of the fathers and their, the, the impact on, on their children. And this connection, what they're finding, is fundamental to human existence. Because it reflects something of our creator. After healing on the Sabbath, Jesus was accused of acting against the Father's will. But Jesus is not a rebel. He's not dissonant with his father, from his Father. Jesus is in perfect harmony with his Father, like Elijah sitting in the pew with me during communion. You see, God is, is one in, in three persons, the Father, the, the Son, the Holy Spirit, living in this loving communion and unity, adoring one another in deep intimacy, the Trinity embodies perfect unity, tri-unity. They're not in conflict with one another. Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath was not a violation of the Sabbath. It exemplified what God would have done in that situation because God did do that in this situation. Jesus is God. God is one. And if this is true, 
then to know God, we must begin with Jesus. The religious leaders were also angry because Jesus equated himself with God. Jesus is God, come in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, and no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, but he has made him known. He came, Jesus came so that people could know God, that they could see him, hear him, touch him. One day Jesus is going to return and we're going to be able to, to see him, to hear him, to touch him, to, to smell him. He's going to be in the flesh. And can you begin to imagine the love that God has for you? That he would cross this gulf so that we could draw near. As the children's catechism says, God is a spirit. He does not have a body like man. And yet the son took on a body. For someone to know you, to truly know you, you must be present. You don't really know people via Facebook, right? They must incarnate themselves. There was a Christian author I used to read. Uh, I still occasionally read him. He came to our city to speak uh, back in Pennsylvania. And uh, after he spoke, I actually got to hang out with him uh, for a little bit. And as I hung out, I began to realize there was a disconnect between who he was and his writings. As his presence revealed himself, I learned who he really was. Jesus presenced himself on earth so that we can know him. Jesus, as Paul says, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. God's plan to initiate a relationship with us was to send us someone who could perfectly image himself and reconcile us to God. Jesus is the truest, the truest revelation, the truest image of God whom we relate to God. Jesus incarnated himself to, to accommodate us so that we could see him and see who God is. And unlike that author I met, Jesus is no different from the words that he had spoken to us through the Old Testament prophets. He lives in this profound relationship in the Trinity, and now because of his incarnation in the cross, his perfect communion and love have been extended to wrap around his people to draw them in. We now join in a taste of, of adoring God in the deep intimacy that they share. In our book club, we're reading Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And just in our last meeting, Paul Tripp wrote in chapter 6, he says, Part of the problem is that our sin makes us morally unfit to look on God. But in our spiritual blindness as sinners, we also do not see God in the sense that we do not recognize his glory, the glory of his grace and power operating in and around and through us all the time. Yet light bursts into our darkness. Tripp says God addresses our blindness by sending his one and only son to earth. See, sin causes us to become amazed by other things, to direct our adoration away from Jesus and to the things Jesus created. Nonetheless, he moves into our darkness to shine light. Is Jesus someone that you are amazed by? How has his love and mercy 
and constant pursuit of you led you to adoration. Another reason we can be amazed by Jesus is, second, Jesus gives life. Verse 21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son and does not honor the Father who sent him, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Jesus gives life because he's the source of all life. God is truth. God is life. Jesus says, this is eternal life in John 17. This is eternal life, that they may know me, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To know Jesus is to have life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Friends, we know something is not right with this world. Things are not the way they are supposed to be. If we are honest with ourselves, we're not the way we are supposed to be. We were created to have fellowship with God, but something has gone wrong. We were created to adore God and be amazed by him, but instead we find ourselves amazed by worldly things and adoring them over Jesus. And the Bible's word for this is sin, which makes life cursed. A curse, we just sang about it in one of our hymns. A curse means life is not what is intended. Everything is being drained of its purpose which is why the curse leads to death, the opposite of, of God who is blessing in life. Have you seen the evidence in your life that things aren't the way they should be, that we live amidst the curse? Every funeral, every funeral, I think, no, this isn't natural. This isn't the way things should be. There's a problem and there's a needed solution. Do you ever feel disappointed in yourselves? That you haven't lived up even to your own expectations or that you have done wrong? Have you felt the pains of the curse because others have done wrong against you? Sin leads to the curse, which leads to death. It's one of the empirical doctrines of Scripture. We all feel it. Uh, I woke up uh, at 1 a.m. a few nights ago, might have been a few weeks ago, having heard 15 gunshots, most likely an entire magazine being unloaded, and then a car speeding away, 1 a.m. I woke up angry. This is not the way things should be. Uh, before moving to Vicksburg, I was preaching at a church downtown in our city. Uh, a woman came forward to take communion, and I could see that she was hurting when she came forward. Uh, she approached me after the service. She was angry, telling me about the horrific abuses that she suffered many decades ago at the hands of her parents, and how now she's still living in the darkness of that evil including her own proclivity to hurt others. The curse leads to death in our lives. To restore fellowship with God, he gives us life through knowing Jesus. Now, when the Bible speaks of, of knowing, it's not just head knowledge. It's not abstract knowledge. It's a relationship. It's adoration. It's love. When scripture declares that the Lord knows you, it's saying that he intimately loves you and he will care for you, that he will undo the curse. Scholar 
Derek Kidner said, to know is more than to be informed. It includes to care about, to own, or even to identify oneself with. God loves you so greatly that he sent his son in the flesh to identify with you, to identify with you in, in your life, to give you life, to know him fully and to be known by him. One of our deepest desires is that we would be known. When I was a teacher, I had this part-time colleague who was so extraordinarily gifted. And she was also, she was just kind, she was brilliant. But I always got this sense that she was lonely. She was so crucial in helping the senior class graduate my last year teaching there. Uh, she was so crucial in helping them in their big end of the year project, their senior thesis. And to show her appreciation, that class, which isn't, that class wasn't known for their kindness. Uh, what they did was they came together and they bought her a gift. And I noticed that she was emotional in the teacher's lounge. So I just gently asked her, well, what does this gift mean? Well, earlier in the year, she had shared just briefly, just a little bit of personal information which the students then use that information to get her a thoughtful gift based off of what she had shared. And I remember when she was explaining this to me in the teacher's lounge, I don't even know if she was consciously where she did. She took the gift and she held it close to her chest and she started hugging it and she said, I feel so known. One of our deepest desires is to feel known. What does it mean to truly know someone? It means to love, to adore, and to marvel at every detail of who they are. To be known by God and to know him is to experience life in its fullest, even in the face of the curse and sin that Jesus understands the pain and the death and the curse and that he has come to bring life. Marvel at him. Marvel at what he has done for you. Know him. And to know him is eternal life. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. He gives you life where sin has left death. Death in your ability to resist temptation. Death in your ability to love others properly. The, the curse, it touches every aspect of your life. And Jesus gives life that you may be brought in to his love and his adoration to respond with marvel. This word in Greek, it, it carries the sense that something extraordinary is right in front of you. And it has captivated your heart. I have a childhood friend who broke into the music industry. First, by creating music for commercials. I did a couple McDonald's commercials, Samsung, Pampers. Uh, but now he moved on to composing uh, for shows, and I think he even did a movie a couple years ago. From an early age, I recognized he was a musical prodigy. He could play anything on the piano, whether it was you gave him the music or he just heard it by ear. And by high school, he had already begun to excel in singing, operatic singing. Anything he touched in the musical realm was just magnificent. <laughs> However, there was this unusual dynamic at school. He wasn't an athlete, so he wasn't popular among the boys. So they made fun of him for being a nerd. Despite this, he was like, he was like a Casanova when it came to the girls, which probably didn't help with the guys. But the girls adored him. They understood they were in the presence of greatness. They were captivated by him, and they marveled. Marveling and adoring God involves a deeper understanding of him, yet it's, it's not just 
reading the right theology books. I can possess accurate facts about my wife and we could still have a terrible relationship. God sent his son in the flesh to break the curse by conquering it. This mission is one of rescue, where he shines light into the darkness, where he brings life out of death, and we marvel by faith being brought into his love and adoration. And how can one not be amazed by Jesus? He draws near. He draws near even when we pull back. He conquers our sin. He undoes the curse. He brings life to where sin has brought death. And he just desires our hearts. He wants you to know him, to love him, to honor him, and to marvel at his presence. Do we comprehend that we are in the presence of greatness? This leads to my third and final point. Jesus brings justice. Verse 23. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. Also verse 27 here, he has given him, that is God has given, the Father has given Jesus authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. The doctrine of judgment is one that is, unfortunately, it's being challenged not just outside the church, but it's even being challenged now within churches today. If we give up this doctrine, what else do we lose with it. We live in a cursed world. Uh, the Western world, in many ways, is one that is becoming skeptical of any kind of authority, anyone who says they know the truth. And in some ways, it might be a little understandable, right? Church scandals have cost church leaders their credibility. Uh, politically, don't even need to go there, things are even worse, they're a mess. Recently, we watched cities destroyed by a hurricane, citizens displaced while leaders poured billions into escalating foreign wars. We're, we've lost our ability to trust leaders. We see the evidence of the curse. If there is no judgment day, every evil that has ever been committed risks escaping the divine scales of justice, leaving victims without hope for the wrongs that they've endured, for the harms and wounds that they have experienced. Think about it. If there's no judgment day, historical atrocities like the Holocaust could be overlooked. But also, personally, any sins, evils, abuses that you have suffered would be free from the scales of justice. Many of us carry wounds for how others have treated us, whether emotional, even physical, financial, whatever it may be. Love and justice will want to move toward the sufferer and against the evil. So if God doesn't care to bring perfect justice then he doesn't truly love. But God does love his creation. God loves his people. So God does care to bring justice. For Jesus to judge sin is that final act of undoing the curse, the, the sin that has damaged us and the damage that our sins have done to others will be made right. We have hope that light will shine in the darkness, that blessings will be given to bind the wounds of the curse. And the promise for life has two dimensions. First is the resurrection. When Jesus returns, we will be raised in life, in bodies entirely free from the curse. 
But secondly, Jesus says that you can have a taste of that life now. Eternal life is not only being delivered from the wrath of justice when Jesus returns, but it's having a taste of that life now. The curse begins to be undone now when the Spirit comes into your life and gives your heart life that you may know Jesus and have life amidst the curse. Life despite afflictions, life despite diseases, life in the face of death. Here are some questions for reflection that I'll leave with you. First, if Jesus has come to make God known, how are you growing in that knowledge and relationship with him? If he's Drawing near to you, how are you drawing near to him? Or are you drawing away? Do you commune with him through prayer, through his word, by communing with his people? How does your life exhibit this marveling at and honoring Jesus. Where do you see growth? Second, if Jesus has given you life through faith, where have you seen him bringing life to death? Is there a strained relationship that has been healing? Do you see evidence that you have uh, hope Amid struggles? Is he sending people who encourage you and build you up? Do you find yourself marveling at what Jesus has done and is doing in your life? Maybe you exhibit courage where you were once fearful. Are you patient where you were once anxious? And if not, why do you believe you lack the work of Jesus' spirit? in your life? Have you asked the Lord? Do you not look for his work and blessings in your life? Are you blind, spiritually blind, to what God is doing in your life? Are you amazed by other things so as to direct your adoration away from the Lord? Lastly, if Jesus will come to bring justice against sin and evil and finally undo the curse, do you find yourself feeling more grief for your sin? Do you find yourself seeking forgiveness more regularly? Do you find yourself confessing to God and to others seeking their forgiveness? Are you grieved by the curse's effects in your life and in this world? Do you pray and labor with the gifts he gives to see his kingdom become more manifest? Or is Jesus inconsequential to how you live? Jesus will come and he will make everything right. He had to deal with our sins on the cross. Can you not help but to hate the evil within you while simultaneously having hope and marveling more and more at God in Christ? Do you see the hope he has given us to endure and overcome evil, whether it's out there or whether it's in here? Do you see the hope he's given us to endure because of Jesus? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, we are amazed by what you have done for us, what you do in us, in our lives, 
how you give us everything that we need for life and godliness. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for your spirit to drop the scales from our eyes so that we can see more and more how you are drawing near to us, how you are giving us uh, everything we need to be blessed, to endure the curse, to overcome evil with good, to have patience in adversity, to have thankfulness in times of plenty. Uh, Lord, forgive us when we fail to honor you as we should. When we fail to honor you with, with words that do not exemplify this life that you have given us. We ask for forgiveness when we fail to honor you with actions and lifestyles uh, that do not show that life has been given to death. Uh, Lord, Move into our hearts even closer. Work the love and law of Christ into us uh, that we would have lives that show that we are in such marvel and adoration of you that we cast aside all worldly things. We thank you for this hope that you have given us. Amen.